This is a uh, 2011 Mercedes AMG CL63. Uh, this is basically a two door S Class, and AMG is obviously the performance model. So the base MSRP for this car new was around $150,000. Uh, this car as spec was just under $170,000. Uh, this car has every um, spec that you can add to the car other than uh, the Distronic, basically the entire um, driver's aid package with the uh, Distronic Plus, which is the distance based cruise control. And it also doesn't have the uh, lane keep assist or the blind spot assist, but it has every other option available. Uh, the paint on this specific car is a Dezino Graphite Metallic. Um, and if you look closely, it actually has little flecks in the paint. I'm not sure that's going to register on camera, but they are there. And it also has a Dezino interior headliner, which is Alcantara, which is also a, uh, an extra package. The performance package was around $7,200 extra. The Dezino package, I believe, was $6,000. Uh, the paint and the interior. Uh, another option this actually does not have is the um, exterior carbon fiber package. Uh, with the exterior carbon fiber package you basically get a front splitter that is made out of carbon fiber rather than the uh, black that you see here. And you also get carbon fiber on the uh, side view mirrors. And you get a carbon fiber rear diffuser. rather than the future that you see here. So as you can see the wheels on this car are aftermarket. They're uh, 22 by 9 in the front and 22 by 10 and a half in the rear. Normally I wouldn't do wheels this large with uh, tires this thin, but it doesn't affect ride quality too much unless you hit uh, a pothole or a really bad bump. And um, on the freeway it uh, makes no difference whatsoever. Um, it does make the steering a little uh, tighter and it fits the wheel wells really well. Um, as you can see, the, I went with a 10-spoke design that's pretty simple and similar to a stock uh, AMG wheel design. And as you can see, the uh, rotors and the calipers are really large. And if you look at the uh, wheel center cap, that is actually OEM from Mercedes, but it's special order. And if you go to spec out a new AMG, you can actually spec this center cap as an option. And the material is the same as you get on a standard center cap. They're not uh, aluminum or anything. They're the uh, or ABS plastic, whatever it is that they uh, normally use. So the car is powered by a 5.5 liter bi-turbo V8. Uh, this particular one has the performance package, which gives it 563 horses and 630 pounds of torque. Um, the performance package, you can usually tell if the car has it by the carbon fiber engine cover, which was part of the option set for the performance package. It also uh, moves the top speed up from, I believe, five or 155 up to 186 or 183, somewhere around there, um, which you'll never obviously get to use in Los Angeles, but if you were on the Autobahn or somewhere around there, you could uh, take this up to a higher speed. Uh, the AMG Performance Package is now known as the S-Line, so you'll notice that there's no more Performance Package option if you go to uh, spec out a new AMG. They took the performance package and made it its own separate model. So if you ever see a 63S, like an E63S, um, that is the performance package version. So rather than having it as a separate option on the build sheet, it is its own uh, model designation. So the engine itself um, is actually very, very potent and you don't really notice turbo lag, even though it's a bi-turbo setup and it's not sitting inside the V like the newer 4 liter is but it is a very responsive engine. It's got a lot of torque, obviously, uh, being an AMG, and it actually sounds really good uh, for a bi-turbo engine, um, even before they started doing it with the GTS, where they really made it sound amazing. Another cool feature of this car, and I believe they have it on all uh, Mercedes models, even my old uh, 95 E320 coupe had it. Uh, the hood o opens to almost a full 90 degree angle, making it a lot easier to access the engine bay. Um, all you do is lift it up to its first uh, spot, and then uh, there's a little button on the inside of the hinge that you push. Right there. So you hold that little tab down, and then you lift the hood up the rest of the way. And it stays in place uh, perfectly. As you can see, the hood on this car is, uh, is pretty massive uh, compared to the rest of the car. So another thing this car has is complete keyless entry. So you can uh, touch, there's a little pad on the front there. 
that little uh, depression that you see in the door handle. If you touch that, it locks the car as long as the key's in your pocket. Behind that, on the other side of the door handle, if you touch that, it unlocks the car and then you can just pull the door open. And when you do that, the mirrors automatically unfold if you have that set in your uh, instrument cluster. As you can see, the interior of the car, this is a 2011, but they kept this exact body style and interior styling up until 2015, I believe, when it was replaced with the S-Class Coupe. So originally, um, this uh, specific model line was called the S-Class Coupe, and then they went over to CL for uh, three generations, and this is the last of the CL generation. And this was the facelift version. So the uh, differences between the 2010 and 2011 CL were that the uh, 2010 um, and earlier had a 6.2 liter naturally aspirated V8 with a little less horsepower and the exterior styling was uh, was quite different in the rear and in the front. Uh, it had uh, more rounded quad exhaust tips than, uh, than this uh, facelift version and it also had a less aggressive uh, front end. Um, it was a little bit more rounded and it was kind of a balance between what they did with this facelift and what they did with the W215 CL55 uh, which was what uh, the predecessor to this was. Um, which I also owned uh before this car. Another feature this car comes with, obviously, is uh, soft closed doors. All of your uh, controls for your windows in uh, typical Mercedes fashion are right here on the, uh, the armrest of the door. You've also got your uh, seat controls here and also in uh, Typical Mercedes fashion, they're in the shape of your seat, and they're very easy to use. They're not put on the side of the seat like some car companies do, which is very, very annoying. Uh, in this car, they're easily accessible, and uh, they're right where you would want them to be, and it's very intuitive. You also have your memory for your seats, and your heated and uh, ventilated options for the seats, or your buttons for heating and ventilating. Uh, the seats in this car are also uh, completely dynamic. So the seats themselves are made up of... Um, multiple air bladders which uh, can be used to give you a massage. They can also bolster the side bolsters on the bottom and, and sides to uh, keep you in your seat when you're taking hard corners which is a setting that you can adjust the intensity of in the uh, in the command system which is uh, the infotainment system in Mercedes. Uh, this leather is also the most premium leather they offered on the car as an option uh, when you optioned it new. And as I said before when mentioning the door, these are heated and ventilated seats. And the interior of the car has, uh, has held up well for as old as it is. I mean, this uh, particular car is six years old, going on seven, and it still looks uh, pretty modern. Obviously, the infotainment system is outdated compared to the latest and greatest, but it still does the job. Other features this car has is um, it's got uh, drowsiness detection and it's actually it warned me once when I was on a long trip that I was getting drowsy and I pulled over it starts vibrating the steering wheel it won't let you use cruise control and uh, won't let you use um, uh, a couple of their settings that are that are uh, that autonomy to the car so make sure you're paying attention. It also has uh, night vision. Uh, it was their I believe second generation night vision that uh, it also had pedestrian detection and all that good stuff and it really comes in handy on long road trips and it lets you see about three times farther than you can normally in the dark. It's also got a rear view camera. Uh, it's got parking assist where it will tell you if you uh, start driving below 20 miles an hour it'll have a little P that pops up on the instrument clus uh, cluster and it'll highlight in blue with an arrow on which side the, there's a parking spot that's big enough for your car. Uh, once it does that you can stop you put the car in reverse and it'll say, uh, ask you to say okay and it'll actually guide you into the spot uh, using guides on the camera. It's not a full autonomous uh, parking setup like some of the more modern cars, but it does, uh, it does the job. So the feature this car has, which uh, came standard, I believe, was a uh, uh, push to start. So the button is right down here. Um, on these models you could pop that button out and also start it with the key fob if you like. So let's, uh, let's start it up real quick show you what that looks like on the instrument cluster. So as you can see, the whole uh, center screen there where the speedometer is, is digital. 
and on the right and the left two uh, gauges, those are uh, standard mechanical gauges. It's a nice little combination of both. Now as you can see, the speedometer goes to uh, 200 miles per hour. Uh, the car itself, if it's delimited, according to AMG, can actually do 217 miles an hour, um, which obviously you'd only make use of on the Autobahn or on a, uh, on a racetrack or something like that. But um, right now with the performance package, this is uh, deem uh, the, the limit, uh, speed limit is set higher than uh, normal. Normal is 155, it's set to one, it's either 183 or 186, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. As you can see, when you have uh, navigation in the main cluster, um, it shows you your direction of travel and what street you're traveling on. If I go over into audio, it'll tell you which um, audio mode that you're in. Right now I'm in auxiliary because I use a USB uh, tablet. Uh, if you go into AMG, it'll give you all the information about the car. So it'll give you your oil temperature, your coolant temperature, your, whether or not your start-stop is activated. Right now I have it deactivated. Uh, if you go up in there, it'll give you your um, your run times, you can actually uh, do a, a stopwatch as well, which I'll get to in a second. And that's this right here. Um, so you'll see at the top it shows you which gear you're in, and it has a stop uh, watch in the middle, where if I push the plus volume button with this activated, the plus volume button on the steering wheel, um, the whole uh, radio controls on the steering wheel turn into your controls for your uh, race timer, which is what this is. So I hit it again, it'll stop, I can reset it. And you can reset any of these settings too by clicking OK. And whether or not you want to reset it, this works on pretty much every setting in the instrument cluster. Uh, ready for Bluetooth uh, telephony, that means that you can connect your phone. Um, if you are in the telephone, you actually have it connected, it'll let you control it through here. Driver assist, so your electronic slip protection and your attention assist, which I mentioned before. When attention assist is enabled, like I currently have it disabled, but if you enable it, um, you'll see if I go back into here, you'll see at the bottom left of the uh, speedometer, you'll see that little coffee cup uh, with steam coming out of it. That is uh, means your attention assist is activated. Uh, so service, you can, in here it'll tell you if you have any uh, warnings, any check engine light warnings, any OBD2 things you need to scan, uh, your tire pressure. Um, the wheels I currently have on this car are not, uh, they don't support the uh, tire pressure sensors, the, the tires are just too thin. Uh, the assist plus, uh, this lets you know when your next service is due. So as you can see, mine is due in 900 miles. Um, these are all your settings, so your uh, daytime running lights, your adaptive high beam, ass high beam assist. So what this does is you can keep your high beams on and it'll automatically turn them off if it ever senses a car driving in front of you, um, in your direction, or uh, towards you. So you don't blind them and it'll automatically turn them on and off. And I've used this quite a bit on long road trips uh, at night and it actually works really, really well. Um, the uh, speedometer, whether or not you want it in uh, kilometers, or I'm sorry, the additional speedometer, whether or not you want it in kilometers or miles per hour. And if you have that enabled, you'll see uh, at the bottom left of the speedometer, if I disable it, you'll see that it goes away. If I turn back on, it's there again. That's what that's controlling. Uh, units, so this is your, um, your display in units, whether or not you want miles per hour or kilometers per hour. Acoustic lock feedback, uh, whether or not you want it to honk or make a noise when you actually lock the car. If you go into trip, this is all of your uh, trip information. So you can see I just recently did a trip uh, where it logged 366 miles. Uh, it was actually more than that because I reset it about halfway back on the way home. Uh, I drove it up to Nevada uh, to the Hoover Dam and back. So it was, uh, it was probably close to around seven or 800 miles round trip. So we want to go and reset that. Let's do that. Um, you can also just have it show your speedometer um, in, uh, in the center. It'll tell you what your range is on your tank, so you can see I'm due for a fill up already. I've got 20 miles left. Um, once it gets low enough, it'll actually just say uh, refuel, or uh, I think it just says refuel and it shows a picture of the car next to a gas pump or something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, this is also your tripometer from reset. So you can have a, you have a tripometer from reset and it automatically, uh, another one from start, which automatically starts as soon as you start the car and resets itself. I'm going to go back in the Navi, which is where I uh, usually keep it uh, by default. 
So another thing you may notice in the uh, bottom right of the uh, speedometer below the uh, reverse neutral drive part lettering is uh, the letter C. So what that stands for is comfort, which um, adjusts your suspension, um, I'm sorry, not your suspension, your transmission. So when you have it in comfort or controlled efficiency, it um, will basically start the car in second gear. So by default, the car starts up in, in comfort or, or uh, controlled efficiency. So what it'll do is the, the, it'll automatically start the car in second gear and it'll automatically have eco mode on. So if I have eco mode on right now, you'll see the little eco pop up. Now you notice that it's yellow at the moment. Um, when it's yellow, that means it's start stop will not activate because it doesn't have uh, enough reserve energy to start the car again and keep everything running if you go to a start stop. So when it turns green, it basically charges itself up as you drive. So when it turns green, then start stop will activate as soon as you uh, bring the car to a complete stop. So if I push this button again and go into S, which is sport or standard mode, um, this gives you uh, first gear. Uh, this, so this car has a seven speed transmission. So when you put it in first gear, it also uh, tightens up your uh, gearing ratio. And I have to look this up, I'm not positive. It, it, I, it feels like it does um, actually tighten the steering wheel uh, response a little bit as well. But I have to double check on that. If I push it again, you'll see it goes into full manual mode. So with full manual mode, you can um, change the gears by using the uh, paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Put it back into comfort mode. So if it's in standard or manual or any other mode and you hit the um, eco mode, it'll automatically go back into comfort with eco mode activated. Another thing you'll notice, if I put it into drive and I push my foot down, if I put it into drive with the door open, it'll tell you that you can't do that. So it's gonna wait for me to uh, close the door. So once I do that, um, and I have the car in drive, and I push my foot hard on the brake, you'll see on the bottom left, it has a uh, uh, text that says hold to the uh, bottom left of the speedometer. What this does, and you'll see that it's still in drive, so right now I have my foot off of the brake, so what it does is it'll actually hold the brake for you without having to have your foot on the pedal. Um, as soon as you hit the gas or push the brake hard again, it'll uh, release hold. So if I push the gas a little bit, you'll see that it, it turned it off. If I push it again, it'll go back into hold. It's actually a really cool feature, and the first time it activated, I didn't know what it was. I thought my transmission was having an issue, so I actually restarted the car and all that, and then I looked it up afterwards and found out what it was. But uh, it's a really cool feature, and I use it almost every time I stop. So, uh, yeah, it's a feature I believe all Mercedes, uh, modern Mercedes have, but I'm not positive on that. So put it back into park. Now, if you come over to this area of the uh, instrument cluster, you'll see a few buttons lined up uh, vertically. So the top button uh, can raise and lower the car. I believe it's a two inch difference between the uh, ride heights. The previous generation actually had three different uh, uh, levels that you could push. Uh, this one just has uh, completely uh, lifted or completely lowered. Uh, below that is um, your ABC suspension setting. So right now, since it's lit up, I have it in sport, which tightens your suspension, makes it a lot firmer, and uh, reduces body roll and just makes it, uh, in general, a much sportier, uh, sportier drive. Um, below that, you'll see a P with some uh, some lines coming out. It kind of looks like a, a Wi-Fi symbol. That is your uh, parking sensor. So this car actually has parking sensors front and rear. So I will show you those in a little bit more detail later. In the rear, it has a, a little a screen that comes down from the ceiling, and in the front, it actually shows uh, shows it in the uh, instrument cluster itself. Below that, you'll see two buttons below a monitor uh, icon with uh, what looks like a rotation uh, arrow letting you know that it can, what it does is it it rotates this uh, little screen on the right to either face towards you, face towards the passenger, or face dead center. Now, when I first got this car and I saw that feature, I just thought it was the stupidest thing on the planet. I, I didn't see any use for it because you can't see the screen any more or any less based on which way it's angled. But um, I just recently drove up to Nevada back on uh, about two or three days ago and the sun was going down behind me and I couldn't see the screen, so I figured I'd push the button and see if it actually worked and it completely got rid of the glare. So that is the purpose of these two buttons and it's actually a big lifesaver when you need it. It's the only time I've ever needed it, but it really did come in handy and now I understand why it's there and I don't laugh about it anymore. Uh, the two knobs below that are for your brightness. So uh, you can see the, uh, it's got an arrow pointing to the left and an arrow pointing to the right with a little brightness symbol above that. The uh, knob for the left controls the instrument cluster to the left, the brightness of everything on this side, including your night vision and anything that shows up on here. The uh, knob for the right 
uh, controls the brightness of this screen here in the center, which is your main infotainment screen that has your navigation, audio settings, everything like that. A lot of um, what you see in the cluster over here is a redundancy of what is shown on this screen. So I'll show you exactly what this little uh, tilt looks like on the screen, which I said I thought was useless before until I actually needed it, and it ended up being a lifesaver. So we push the button, and see it turns to the left, push it the other way, it goes to the center, push it again, and it tilts to the right. So in the, the latest version of this car, which is the uh, S-Class Coupe, they actually have a single screen that has uh, two different sets of LEDs that actually one uh, shows to the driver and one shows to the passenger. So you can actually be looking at two different things depending on which seat you're in um, on the same screen, which is uh, really cool and it makes a lot more sense um, than having this, uh, this tilt screen. I imagine it also removes glare because LEDs are tilted. So um, let's go through the uh, command, command itself. So Command is the name of the um, infotainment system in uh, Mercedes. I believe the latest version is called something else, but it is called Command for the longest time, and that's what is in this car. So the Command is actually controlled by this little dial right here. So it's a nice little aluminum dial that uh, you can tilt left, right, up, or down. You can rotate, and you can push. So it basically acts as a pseudo mouse. So let's go through some of the uh, things that show up in the infotainment system. So you always have your navigation, which is your uh, main feature up here, is probably what you'll have up there most of the time. If you uh, go into the screen itself and you click, you can get a full screen view of just your navigation. If you rotate the dial, you can zoom in or zoom out. So right now I just zoomed out, I'm zooming back in. I usually keep it on uh, this zoomed in setting for driving around town just to make sure I'm coming up on a street that I'm, I'm uh, looking for or you know just to uh, have a better idea of where I am. Um, with the navigation open, you can go in and obviously put in an address. Uh, you can do it all through voice command if you like as well, or you can do it manually through here. Uh, it's actually kind of a pain in the ass to use. Um, you can use voice command to put in like an address and a street number and all that, and it, it uh, registers your voice pretty well, but you can't give it a name. You can't just say, hey, uh, take me to uh, you know Best Buy, or you can't just go in there and say, um, hey, I want to go to 555123 Street. You actually have to do it uh, city, street, number, and it's it's actually kind of annoying, but it, it gets the job done. When the navigation's actually um, got a destination inputted, though, it actually works really well. It gives you uh, points of interest pop up on the side um, and all that good stuff. And if you have Sirius XM activated, which this car does have, uh, then you also get uh, real-time traffic and all that good stuff. So if you go to position with um, your navigation uh, active, then it has these options in here. It can say uh, store vehicle position, uh, it all, uh, where am I? If you put where am I, it actually just shows a um, little overview of the actual streets that you're on. Vehicle position on map. Um, if you move around on the map and you want to find your vehicle really quickly, you can just push that and it'll show you where you are. So you can move your position around the map. If you want to like slide somewhere and find out exactly where you are and things like that, you can do that. So if you ever lose your place, you just go back to uh, vehicle position on map. So in here you can also go in, uh, once you have the, your uh, destination uh, entered, you can go in here and get um, info about your route. So you can have symbol info, uh, detours, alternate route, uh, route info, etc. If you go into traffic, uh, right now I have SiriusXM, but it, I don't have a subscription to it. So it'll tell you to subscribe to SiriusXM if you want traffic, but um, I don't really need it, and I don't really use SiriusXM. So, um, <clears throat> other settings in here are your audio settings. So if you go into your audio settings, it'll take you to your um, main audio screen, which in here you can uh, click on audio again, and you can select which source you want to use. So it's got FM, AM, satellite radio, which is the uh, Sirius XM. You have disc. This has a, a six disc in-dash uh, CD changer, but I don't know who uses CDs anymore. Uh, you can use a memory card reader. You can use a, mi a music register where you can actually copy media over to the car itself. Um, there's a media interface, which is basically what you would use for like, um, I don't know, like an iPhone or something like that that's that's plugged in, you can control it from here. Uh, you have your USB, which is what I use. Um, I'm sorry, you have USB and you have auxiliary. So auxiliary is actually just a, a standard audio jack. Uh, USB does the same thing, you can plug a USB stick in there and it'll read audio off of there. Um, or you can turn audio off down at the bottom. So I'll go more into depth about how I have my audio set up afterwards. So if you go into sound, it gives you all of your uh, controls. So this car has a... Um, 
Harman Kardon audio system with uh, 3D sound and uh, Logic 7. So as you can see, you have bass, treble, uh, your balance and fader, and whether or not you have 3D audio on or off. So next would be your uh, telephone. When you have your telephone connected here, it'll show your list of contacts. So if I go into data connections, Bluetooth telephones, and then select the phone that I want to use, it's all going to be in here. So if you go into video, and you have a um, you have a uh, USB drive or something plugged in that has video on it, you can actually pull the uh, the video from here, and you can modify the sound for uh, video under here. So you can actually watch video on the screen if you want to. Um, I've actually never used it for that, so I'm not sure how well it works, but I'm sure it's uh, it's it's as you'd expect. Um, so under vehicle, this is where a majority of your settings are. So under vehicle, you get all of your settings. Um, and like I said, it's basically a redundancy of what you get in the cluster. There's some things that only show up in here and nowhere else, but a lot of them are uh, redundancy. So whether or not you want the uh, eco mode on and off, which I already covered, um, your exterior lighting delay. So how long it takes for the lights to shut off after you leave the car and lock it. Locator lighting on. So if you push a lock or unlock button on your car, it's gonna flash the lights so you can find it easily, uh, more easily. Automatic mirror folding, so whether or not the mirrors fold in when you turn the car off and lock it. Automatic locking, um, so this is when you, uh, basically when you walk away, or I'm sorry, when you start driving the car, um, once you hit 10 miles per hour, the doors will automatically lock. Easy entry exit, so this basically moves the, um, you can tell it what to do, but it basically moves the uh, seat and steering column um, far apart from each other so you can get in and out of the car a lot more easily. There's also um, ambient lighting, um, so you can control the color of it. It's not as advanced as the normal one where you can kind of select from a color wheel which color you want. You have solar, neutral, and polar. So solar is basically red, neutral is white, and polar is blue, and then you also have a uh, brightness setting. I usually keep mine on neutral white because it just looks cleaner and it's uh, not as flashy. It looks really good. Um, interior lighting delay, uh, same thing as the exterior lighting delay, how long it takes the lights to shut off after you lock the car. Uh, rear window shade, whether or not it's extended, um, it'll tell you when you push it if it's extended. So I just retracted it, and you'll see it says retracted, put it back up and it's going to go back to extended. Trunk opening height restriction, so you can actually open the trunk to a certain height and enable this and it will never open the trunk uh, beyond that if you have like a really low overhang or something that you park near, it uh, comes in handy sometimes. Multifunction contour seat settings. So this is uh, where all the fun happens. Now these seats, if you look at every area that's being highlighted in orange, each of those is a different section of the seat that you can control. So um, you can control the, the intensity of the bolsters on the sides, on the bottom sides, you can adjust the uh, lumbar in the back, you can adjust the shoulders. Now you also see on the side that you have uh, you have massage. Now if you look at the names for the massage, they kind of crack me up. You have slow and gentle, slow and vigorous, fast and gentle, or fast and vigorous. Um, but the massage in this car is actually really good. I remember in the previous generation of this car, the massage was was pretty crappy. It was basically just like a squirrel kneading your back or something. Um, so if you go into dynamic seat, this will adjust the intensity of the uh, dynamic seat, which means the side bolsters will um, inflate and kind of hold you in place as you take hard corners, and it's all speed sensitive and based on how many Gs the car is pulling, etc. Etc. So uh, it's actually a really cool feature. So those are for all the driver's side, and you can also do the passenger side from here as well. All right, so that pretty much covers the infotainment system. Now let's go into the more of the controls in the car. So down here in the center console, which is here, um, you'll see that there are uh, quite a few buttons uh, laid out, and they're laid out in a nice, uh, nice clean way. So up here you have your uh, hazard flashers, the button for your hazards. On the right. Uh, next to the hazards, immediate to the right of it, you have your um, massage seat uh, quick button. So this will actually, as soon as you push this, it'll just bring up the massage uh, menu on your um, on your main uh, info screen. On the right, you have uh, Telenavi, uh, which will automatically go to the Telenavi settings. On the left, you have uh, disc radio toggle, and to the left, uh, to the immediate left of the hazards button, you have a uh, back arrow, which lets you go back in any menu that you're in. And here, as I mentioned before, you have the uh, the dial, which is basically like a little pseudo mouse that you use for navigating your uh, center screen. And right here, you have buttons for three different things. So at the bottom, you have your uh, rear sunshade. 
Um, above that, you have the rear headrest, which if you push it, the headrest will go down. If you have nobody in the back seat, it gives you better visibility. Or you can hold it to actually lift them up. And above that, you have your button to switch between uh, comfort, or controlled efficiency, uh, manual, and standard slash sport. On the right side, you have two buttons and one, um, one dial. So the little knob in the middle actually uh, allows you to control the volume. Uh, the button at the top uh, turns on or off the uh, stereo system. And the one on the bottom controls your eco mode, whether or not it's on or off. So if you look up here, um, this screen is not stock. Uh, obviously, this is something I put in um, just so I had a little bit more uh, functionality in the car. So as you can see on here, this is a, uh, this is a Sony uh, tablet. It's extremely thin and extremely lightweight. It's about seven, seven and a half inches and uh, it lets me run everything from Spotify to Netflix to HBO Go, uh, Google Navigation, everything that I want to run on here I can, I can run. And you'll see the cables coming out of it. One is the uh, charger cable. It goes straight into the USB port in there for charging. It keeps it charged at all times. Uh, this is my um, audio connection, so I'm actually using this to go into the aux port inside the glove box, which I'll touch on a little bit later. And before I leave the center area, so down here, you have uh, cup holders. They're actually in a very convenient location, but because I put the tablet here, it kind of blocks them. So I have to tilt the tablet down uh, in order to, to put drinks in there. But it's a small sacrifice to make. Um, and then in here, uh, you've got an ashtray, which I don't smoke, so I never use it, but it is there. And the little lever on the left lets you actually pop the ashtray out if you want to clean it. And uh, there's obviously a cigarette lighter uh, right next to that. As you can see, this car also has the uh, carbon fiber interior package. All the paneling and everything in here is carbon fiber uh, rather than wood, which was a, an extra option when you ordered the car. All right, so if you come up here, you'll see um, you have an array of buttons, um, and they're all laid out uh, horizontally. All these buttons up here control your air conditioning and uh, defrosters. So the left side, um, from the off button, that's all the uh, driver side controls. The right side from the off button is all the passenger side controls. You'll see up here, it also has a, uh, an analog clock. This is a uh, IWC clock. And what's really cool about it, if you go in and change your time in here, you'll see it actually has a graphic representation of the clock itself. So if I change the time in here, let's say I change it to four o'clock, when I push it down, you'll see that it's changed. Now, if I change it back to three, and uh, I look at the clock down here, you'll see that it automatically winds it, which is very cool. We're actually seeing this on another car. I'm sure all Mercedes now that have analog clocks have this. So we change it back to three and push it down. You'll see that it automatically uh, winds the clock to whatever time you, you input in the digital screen, which is really cool. Two more things near the uh, steering wheel. So this is your uh, control for all of your uh, headlights. Um, so on the left, you'll see a P with a left and right arrow. That is a uh, parking light. So in Europe, the roads are so so narrow that they have on all, at least all Mercedes that I've seen, I'm not sure if all European cars have them, but they have a, a parking light. So basically, if you, if you put that on the left or right arrow, it's going to uh, keep the lights on on the left side or the right side of your car. So your headlights and your tail lights uh, when you keep the car parked. And they run in a mode that doesn't drain the battery overnight. So you can leave them on overnight and you'll be fine. That way people can see your car a lot easier. And I use them a lot if I park in an area where I'm a little... Uh, worried about someone hitting the car, especially at night. <clears throat> the little switch on the left of the uh, headlight knob is your night vision, which will only uh, come on if it's dark enough outside. If not, it'll tell you that it, it must be nighttime for it to be activated. All right, so I'm gonna hop into the uh, passenger side real quick and show you some things from this side. So this is the uh, glove box. You can see there's a 12, uh, 12 volt outlet alongside a uh, USB port. So the USB port you can use for data or charging. Um, it's not meant for charging, so sometimes, depending on what you're using, like it's not enough to keep this tablet charged, so I actually plug it into the 12-volt outlet. As you can see, I have two USB plugs in that 12-volt outlet. Um, one's going to the tablet, and one is a, a phone charger for when I have my phone in here and I want to be able to charge it. If you look over here, this is your uh, media interface port. So you can use this for uh, an iPhone connection or whatever you want to use it for. Right now, I'm using it to uh, plug into my audio jack on my tablet. So it has a standard audio jack uh, attachment for it. And this just came with the car from the dealer. So it, it comes, uh, comes with that from factory. If you look over here, there's a, uh, there's a holder for two pens. The previous generation of this car actually had like a little fold out thing that had some pen holders and some business card holders and all that stuff, but this one they just made it uh, pen holders. I guess nobody was really using it uh, in the previous generation. 
A few more cool things about the car. Uh, the doors, and I believe they still have this. Actually, no, I think they removed this on the new S Coupe, but they used to have uh, chrome covers on the uh, door inserts, which are really, really cool. And um, they were actually aluminum, and they just gave the car a much more uh, high-end feel. And they also helped with sound deadening, I believe. As you can see, it's got the uh, carbon fiber running along the, uh, the armrest of the door. It's also got it up here by the handles and the, and the buttons. And in the rear, you can see it's got carbon fiber covering the uh, center uh, storage compartment. And as you can see, the entire uh, headliner is um, Alcantara. This is a Dezino Black Alcantara, so that's a special option for this car. You can see the rear sunshade that I was mentioning earlier. Um, the steering wheel in this car is also a special order AMG Performance steering wheel. At least that's what it says on the original spec sheet, which I will uh, post at the end of the video. As you can see, it's also got um, aluminum pedals. So an interesting thing about these cars is, and I didn't find this out, I kind of found it out the hard way because I was wondering why things weren't working through the glass. There's a small section of glass on the windshield in these cars that allows RF signals to go through. Uh, they won't go through anywhere else in the car, and the, um, the glass in this car is uh, actually designed to block out all different kinds of, uh, of waves, uh, from RF signals to uh, UV, etc., etc. Um, another very cool thing about the glass, which I will show you in a minute, is that it's double glazed. So another cool feature of this car is the, uh, all the glass in it is actually double glazed, uh, laminated, so it's actually two pieces of glass on top of each other. This uh, increases sound deadening. Um, it also improves uh, the structural rigidity a little bit because this car does not have a B pillar, which is what makes it a coupe, other than the styling. So if you look at the uh, window here, hopefully this registers on camera, it's actually two pieces of glass. And same thing with the, uh, the back window. Uh, the windshield and rear glass as well, and I believe even the um, sunroof glass are all uh, double glazed. So this brings me on to another very cool feature of the car, which is the fact that when you put all the windows down, you have a completely unbroken arch all the way uh, through the car. So you can put the front windows down and the rear windows down, and um, as you can see here, you can see straight through the car. This is one of my favorite features of this car. Um, and whenever weather uh, permits, I drive it around like this. Uh, it's just, uh, it looks really cool. And with uh, the windows open and the sunroof open, you're pretty, uh, pretty close to having a convertible. Obviously, you have this whole back section that still stays fixed. But uh, it gives you, uh, for the most part, the uh, feeling of having a convertible, which is pretty cool. I'll show you what it looks like with this uh, armrest down as well. So as you can see with the armrest down, it's actually uh, pretty snug and comfortable back here. That's another thing I love about this car compared to um, some of the cars that it's supposed to uh, compete with, like the Bentley GT, and um, obviously this, uh, the Rolls-Royce Wraith wasn't out when this was uh, the current model. But one thing this does better than all those is it actually, it's, it's a huge car. A lot of people don't understand this is a two-door S-Class and it's only about three or four inches shorter than a, the full four-door S-Class but it uh, cocoons you in really, really well. Um, for being a two-door car and as big as it is, it doesn't feel like this big, spacey, um, huge cabin that you're sitting in. It's, uh, it's, it's very much like a cocoon. It feels like a much smaller car when you're inside of it, which uh, I like. So this car is uh, in the Grand Tour class, which means it's designed for uh, going long distances at high speeds um, and extreme comfort. So if you look at the uh, trunk size in this car, it's actually pretty large. You can see I have a, a large backpack in there that's uh, for the camera I'm using. Um, I've got some clothes in there and all that stuff, and there's still a lot of space. You could easily fit three large suitcases in here, which I have done in the past for, uh, for long trips. Now, as I mentioned, there is a uh, button on the door to open and close the trunk. You can open it by pushing the button, and then you can close it by holding the button, and it's all, um, it's all completely motorized. So there are actually three ways you can open the trunk. You can do it by the button on the door, you can do it by the button on the trunk itself, which is just under the star, or you can do it by holding the button on the key fob. And you can also close it in uh, two of those three ways. You cannot hold the button on the key fob to close it, but you can do it by pushing the button here on the trunk itself. So as you see, the button on the left closes the trunk, the button on the right will close it and then lock the car. And then there's also the button on the door, which I mentioned before, if you hold that, the, uh, the trunk will close. So if I push the button here, and the trunk will close. So this is one of the uh, interior compartments other than the glove box. This is in the uh, center armrest. Uh, you can push a button and that door will open either left or right, depending on uh, which side you want to open it from. 
And you'll see in this compartment, it's got a little uh, dial here. That dial tells it, uh, you can tell the car whether or not you want to have the um, air conditioner vent open inside of this, uh, this compartment. So you can actually uh, cool and heat this compartment depending on which uh, air conditioner temperature you have, which is really cool. It's pretty spacious. You could fit, uh, you know, a tablet in here. You could fit, uh, you know, smaller things, obviously, but you could fit uh, quite a few things in here, and um, it's a nice little storage compartment. So in the back, as I mentioned before, there's another compartment um, in the center. This one is a little smaller than the uh, deep compartment in the front, but it's still big enough to hold uh, sm some smaller items. So in the rear, you can see um, I have the armrest down with uh, the top open. So the top open, you have a nice little storage compartment. Uh, back there in the front you have an, a little tray that you can put things in that uh, stays completely closed when you have the top down and you, as you can see there are also cup holders that slide out there and you have room for two uh, normal size cups or one larger cup in the middle and these cup holders actually work really really well they're uh, they're very sturdy uh, this car is also equipped with uh, illuminated AMG door sills which you can see here another very cool feature of the car is uh, the entire headlight assembly so this car actually has uh, uh, fully dynamic headlights. They'll turn with the car and they're speed sensitive. And they'll also raise and lower based on um, the, uh, the road ahead of you. When you first turn the car on, they're uh, tilted down a little bit. And then when you turn it on, they, they raise up, which is kind of a, a cool look when it, uh, when it first uh, starts. Also, if you look inside there, all the way on the left, that's actually a, um, a light specifically for turning. So when you turn on a blinker or you turn the wheel far enough and you're going a certain speed, that light will actually come on and illuminate um, about 90 degrees on the side of the car. It has it left and right. So as you can see, that light bulb in there is now illuminated because I have the blinker on. And that's uh, what the blinker looks like. It's also obviously got side markers um, on the mirrors for uh, when you have the turn signals on. Another thing they did, which is really cool, rather than having a, uh, a reflective side marker like most cars do, or a uh, side marker light somewhere on the fender or over there like they do on uh, a lot of other cars, even like Ferraris and Lamborghinis, they actually incorporate it into the headlight assembly. So it's on the side of the car, but it's nice and clean and tucked away and it doesn't uh, look weird just as a tacked on afterthought. So going into the rear, you can see what the taillights look like. All right, so I'm gonna show you how the uh, parking sensors work. So you see the uh, series of uh, dots along the top, uh, just below the P and above the line. So those tell you how close you are to an object in your front right and front left, respectively. So right now there's nothing close to the left side of my car. There's something creeping in on the left. So get closer. And then when I get too close, it's gonna beep. Um, it's going to have a uh, constant beep, and it's going to let you know that you're way too close. Um, and now this is also very sensitive. It detects uh, pedestrians, and it also detects uh, animals and things like that. So it's, uh, it's pretty sensitive. So in the rear, it's got a little um, LED display with uh, the same dots that you see in the front. There's a, a wall directly behind me, and as I get closer to it, you're going to see those lights uh, start to light up. And then eventually, if it'll tell you to stop. So another thing you'll notice is you see that little P at the top? That only shows up when you get below 20 miles per hour. And what that means is it's looking for a parking spot. Because it knows you're uh, at creeping speed and you're looking for a parking spot possibly. So when it detects one big enough for your car, it'll actually highlight in blue and have a little arrow just like that, showing which side of the car your, um, your parking space is available on. So I throw it in reverse now. And you'll see it says check surrounding and uh, press OK to confirm. So as soon as I hit OK, it's going to guide me into the spot. Another cool feature this has is um, right now I have the car, as you can see, in drive, but I've got the brake on hold over on the left there. If I go and open the door, it'll automatically put the car in park and put on the parking brake as well. It's a very cool uh, safety feature. All right, so I'm going to uh, enable night vision. I've already turned the uh, brightness all the way up on the center uh, instrument cluster. So once I hit the night vision button, you can see that night vision is now on. So it keeps all of your information um, still on the screen and most of it in the same place. So you'll see you have the uh, kilometers per hour, the hold notification for the brakes, um, the gear selector, reverse, neutral, drive, and park. 
And you also have your speedometer, but now it's uh, horizontally laid out along the bottom and it maxes out at what looks like 180. Um, so with uh, the night vision assist, it only comes on if it's dark enough outside and if it's not, it'll tell you. Um, once you do have it on, it actually has a pedestrian detection which activates, I believe it's at certain speeds. You'll see a little icon at the top right that shows a pedestrian walking um, across some, some street lanes. You'll see a little icon for that. And then um, if it actually detects a pedestrian, and I've, I've seen it in action, it actually has a little uh, square uh, crosshair around that, that uh, person moving across the screen. I believe it works for uh, animals as well. So now that I have it on, I'm going to drive a little bit here and show you how, show you how it works in action. And one more thing since we're um, talking about the center console, uh, another very cool thing is the way the speedometers work. Uh, the speedometer gauge um, actually floats. It, act it was a physical gauge in the CL55 that actually floated. It, had a, it was attached to where the lines for the speed were rather than in the center so it gave the illusion that it was actually floating which was really cool. But on here they did the same thing but digitally. Another cool thing about that is when you activate cruise control, which is only activatable um, above 20 miles per hour, you'll see that it actually has a marker where your uh, cruise um, is set to, which is very, very cool. All right, so that concludes the overview for the 2011 CL63 AMG. You're currently looking at the spec sheet for the car and I hope to be doing more videos like this in the future. Uh, I'm gonna conclude this video with a few still shots of the car.